things on my hands that I built, which are uh, accelerometers. They are transmitting three, uh, well, right now they are transmitting three, uh, three axes of acceleration, so rate of change of movement in, in three directions uh, to my computer. Well, they are not. I'll turn them on and check if they actually work. But uh, when they do work, they send that information, and I uh, and I use them as an instrument. Um, so the, I have a bunch of slides, and I just want to quickly go through uh, through how I arrived at this piece. Uh, there is a precedence to what I do in terms of playing uh, computers um, in real time. Uh, there's Max Matthews with the radio, the radio baton, and I. Uh, I just want to show these things because it's. Uh, it looks like it's new, but these things have been done for 50 years now. And uh, when I come up with something that I feel like uh, it's new and inventive, then I realize, oh, it actually been done. Well, but uh, there's there's a lot of uh, interesting people to to look to. Uh, Laurie Anderson, not a maybe direct influence, but. Uh, something I really want to try at some point, uh, controlling playback with a violin bow. Uh, she did put a uh, violin, uh, she did put a uh, magnet tape and a, a tape head uh, on a violin so she could actually play a sample with her bow. That's pretty rad. Letizia <laughs> um, uh, Sonami, uh, much more of a direct reference for for my work, but again, this has been done. Uh, I think she she did her things in the in the nineties. So um, yeah, um, uh, like they can see that I have less wires on my hands. <laughs> I don't know. Um, this clicker. Okay. Mimi gloves. This is more uh, an actual uh, contemporary example of this technology. Uh, Mimu gloves have more sensors than, than I do, uh, but it's the, the concept is largely similar with using hand motion, hand gestures, and also finger movements, which I'm not using, uh, to control various aspects of the sound and performance. All right, um, so I have been also doing this for, for a while. The first project with this technology is from almost a decade ago now. 
Uh, although uh, I did use accelerometers, but a uh, bunch of other technology around it was different, including the way I transmit these, uh, this information to my computer. Um, the, the devices looked slightly different uh, as well. I've done pieces with uh, computers, uh, with, the, with the performers, uh, musicians, uh, instrumentalists, while they were wearing these, uh, these devices and use them to transform the sound in real time. But, okay, so here's about the piece. This is what I really wanted to quickly talk about. There are a few elements on this piece. There's an element of the gesture, gestural control, so I wave my hands and computer makes sound. Um, uh, there's an element of uh, spatialization. The piece is realized in third order ambisonics spatial sound format. Uh, this is a speaker agnostic uh, spatial sound format which can be decoded into arbitrary arrays of speakers. And I quickly prepared an, a um, decoder for this particular space. So you'll be hearing uh, tonight uh, eight speakers, uh, two in the front, two, in the, uh, two on the sides, two in the back, and two on top, uh, recreating somewhat of a uh, full uh, sound. Hem uh, sem uh, like a hemisphere, like a half dome, uh, plus subwoofer, so nine, nine channels. Uh, I do claim to use machine learning in this piece, and that is true, asterisks. <laughs> it's not being used uh, live during this performance, but it has been used live in other performances. Uh, this is still kind of a work in progress kind of a thing. Uh, and uh, finally, I'm operating on sound corpus, which is a approach to sound synthesis and, and sound manipulation, where you chop up sounds, uh, chop up a sound into small pieces, and then you organize these pieces um, according to common characteristics. Um, so, like a dimensionality reduction, uh, and the way I navigate through. So this this uh, this creates. Uh, typically, a two-dimensional sound maps, which similar sounds grouped in the in the in the similar areas of the two-dimensional sound map, and I'm using through and I'm moving through these sound maps at certain places of my piece using a kind of a direction of my of the tilt of my hand. Uh, a quick note on the uh, devices that I'm wearing. This is the actual current iteration of it. It's a microcontroller which has a uh, Wi-Fi chip built-in and a uh, accelerometer. Uh, actually, it has also gyroscope and magnetometer, but I'm only using the accelerometer right now because uh, uh, sensor fusion is difficult. Um, and messages are being sent over Wi-Fi on a separate network, which seems to be working. We'll see. Um, uh, Ambisonics. This is a uh, Topic for another lecture, I guess, I, and I won't. Uh, I won't pretend that I pretend that I can explain everything about it. But it's a it's a system that encodes a, encodes a full sphere of sound, and the piece was created with this system being central to all sound transformations. So when I play that piece, I can play it in stereo. I can play it in a place like this. Like I can play it where. There's a six, eight speaker setup, and I, the more speakers I have, and the more accurately I prepare the decoder for the space, uh, the more accurately I can uh, uh, present a three-dimensional uh, holographic sound, as they call it. Uh, corpus man manipulation. Um, this is uh, this is a way of uh, organizing sounds in a in a similar uh, grouping sounds in uh, that have similar qualities, uh, and that, that's typically done to uh, get a larger sound file and find uh, place pieces of it that are similar. Anyway, um, what's, oh, machine learning. I am trying to make the piece learn itself as I perform it over and over again. Uh, this is not working as well as I'd like it to work. Uh, I'm using a um, recursive neural network uh, from Google Magenta, uh, but because of how I translate the data between it, I, it's uh, I'm not super happy how it works just yet. Um, this is this is how things work. 
uh, the interface image here. I have a clip. Ah, this is not exactly what's going on, but it's also a network audio system that we use here. I'm connected to the Dante network, and this is how I send all the nine channels using just this one Ethernet cable. All right. Uh, yeah, oh, this is this is a little bit of how my machine learning pipeline works. Uh, so because <laughs> the machine learning was made for music, it operates on MIDI data, but I don't really generate MIDI data here because I'm generating uh, continuous streams of, of, of uh, motion data. That's why I uh, convert it to MIDI, which is uh, maybe a bad choice. But we'll see. Uh, and eventually the, the piece, the, the title of the piece quote, uh, comes from the... Uh, uh, from the nursery rhyme, which was featured in um, in uh, George Orwell's 1984 novel, and it has to do with memory and with remembering. And uh, I used it as a uh, kind of starting point to to think about machine learning, how how the piece can learn itself and remember itself. Okay, so this is this is a quick rundown about the piece, and now I'm gonna play. It. Do you want reverb? No, thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you for reminding me. I meant to ask about that. I forgot to ask you. <laughs> we can still be friends, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 